Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, you're looking all fresh-faced and exercised, and you yoga. <laughs> it's, it's, well, the sun's out, isn't it? So, so Emily, tell everybody what you do. Uh, my name's Emily Harmon. I'm a, a wine consultant, wine expert, whatever you want to call it, but um, my career's in wine. I help restaurants predominantly with their wine list training, um, essentially doing the job of a sommelier, um, but without working on the restaurant floor. So uh, choosing the right suppliers to go uh, to be able to put together a wine list for a restaurant that goes with the food that they offer to negotiate pricing, you know, because a lot of people that own restaurants actually don't necessarily have access to a, a wide breadth of um, of suppliers. So finding the, the people that are appropriate for the size of the business, the price points of the business. Um, so that's something that I do. And, and obviously because I'm doing that for a number of restaurants, I can get better pricing for my clients. And then, uh, yeah, making sure that the people that work in those places can also sell the wine too. So uh, you're in Berlin, but you work between actually uh, the UK and Berlin. Yes. What brought you to Berlin in the first place? Honestly, the reason that I came to Berlin was actually not uh, wine related. Well, the reason I moved to Berlin was I could, or I managed to negotiate and sort of build a network here where I got work contacts. But I came to Berlin originally just out of curiosity for the city and I was really interested in uh, the vibe of the city. And I just came by myself um, actually after a breakup for a few days. And then I was like, oh, I really like the city. I'm going to keep coming back. And then slowly got to know a lot of people in the the food and wine scene here and then that eventually led to me being recommended to um, take care of the, the wine selection for the Mickelberger Hotel when they were relaunching the restaurant program which is almost four years ago now and I met with them and then yeah I've been working with them ever since. And so we met because we both obviously live in Berlin and we're we actually live in the same neighborhood don't we now finally. <laughs> Arlene's got a thing where she thinks the na same neighbourhood means the same block. Which same we do actually now live on the same block, yeah. <laughs> you are um, the closest neighbour that I know. But so you've got the consulting business, you do a lot of work in education, um, which you haven't really talked about or mentioned. I'd love you to talk a little bit about that, but also really uh, your Juice podcast, which I love, which is not just a podcast. You're actually filming it now and it's on YouTube, which I think is even a more fun way to watch you and Gwen uh, talk about your interest in wine. Yeah, so, um, okay, so one thing at a time. So the education fair. So, yeah, that's something actually that it's funny because it's kind of a natural, I guess it's a natural um, progression anyway from the consultancy business. So over the last two years, I've been working with different, um, usually governing wine bodies. So, for example, Appala you know, we all know Appalachian. So for some things be called champagne or whatever it, it, there is a, a governing body that allows those um those wine brands to exist so um over the last few years working with particular appellations so for example Cote de Rhone two years in a row I've been working on their campaign in London um Van de Bourgogne so wines from the Burgundy region as well um bits and pieces coming up as well for Beaujolais I'm a Beaujolais ambassador this year doing a bit with the Prosecco DOC as well so that's just, uh, that works for me is great because it allows me just to like re-dig into sort of my specific knowledge on those places and refresh mm -hmm. as well. And mm -hmm. then I would um, educate and train either uh, wine professionals or restaurant professionals or consumers on, um, you know, the curriculum that is relative to that, that region, that wine body. So I've been doing that more and more which for me i'm i'm loving actually because it's um mm -hmm. it's just like pure knowledge sharing pure teaching um it's not sales based or anything like that there it's just about um inspiring people to get into wine so a lot more of that going on and then with the podcast that you mentioned as well so gwen and i started the podcast i think 18 months ago and we just did it um really um two friends that wanted to share our passion about wine and and we thought the dynamic between somebody who is, you know, informed about wine and someone who's very, very curious and wants to be more informed about wine was a, something that would actually attract a lot of people because I know both, both her and I get asked so many questions about wine every time we go out because it's mm -hmm. a very intimidating topic. 
Of course, yeah, it is intimidating. You can find us on Instagram at juice underscore podcast or on uh, Twitter at juice.podcast. We've got a little website and we've also got a YouTube channel, which is Juice uh, Wine Show and Podcast. So we, and it's all free and it's advert free. We do it at our own cost. We don't take any sponsorship money. So it's like pure, undulter- unadulterated wine information uh, to hopefully inspire people to want to drink better. Um, how, how, in your opinion, I know that you're... Um, reduce hours you've cut back your work but what do you think about the situation in berlin in terms of uh, coronavirus and the impact on the industry um you know look we are we it's still so early to say what the full impact is going to be it's worrying and it's and it's quite um you know it's quite a full-on thing because it's such a fragile industry we all know like cash flow is king when it comes to the restaurant game and and um and so many people are relying on this sort of ongoing trade, ongoing um, mm-hmm. ongoing investment from guests coming in. So it's quite scary for a lot of people because, um, you know, government measures aren't being put in place by particular governments. Here in Berlin, at least we've got a bit of support, but it's still not clear of how much that support will actually be able to continue to sustain the restaurant business. I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. I don't, I'm not informed enough, but I do think it's it's... It's intense enough that everybody's going to feel a hit from this. So Mm -hmm. now's the time more than ever that we all have, we all hold the power, right? Like, I think we've talked about this before a lot with a lot of the other Tewar talks and some of the panel discussions I've watched or been part of with uh, with you. I think, um, you know, we forget sometimes as consumers, because we are all consumers, that Mm -hmm. we hold the power and, and every cent that we spend is is powerful and now more than ever so i think um this is really a time where everybody can maybe address how important is is it to me that independent restaurants continue how important is it to me that chains continue how important is it that i spend money in a supermarket that's only three times what they usually already would and are sort of mm-hmm. taking business away from small green grocers you know like for me it's like I'm buying less of what I need because I know I've recognized how wasteful I've been like in terms of what I purchase. I know that I sometimes buy too much food for one person. So I'm yeah. like, do I actually need to buy this much food? No, I don't. Maybe I can spend the same amount of money, not waste food and put my money in independent businesses instead. That for me is really what I'm recognizing a lot at the moment. Um, so supporting those restaurants that are doing takeaway things in whatever way, like buying a bottle of wine from them rather than the supermarket, you know, it makes a big difference. Yeah. I agree. Any, anybody in Berlin particularly that you want to uh, shout, shout out to? Yeah, I, I've got a little, I've got a small list I'd love to. So uh, for people who want to buy wine, they can go to obviously the Mickelberger Market. Um, there's wine to takeaways. So that's in Friedrichshain. That would be my go-to spot in Friedrichshain. Uh, in Mitte, or Prenzlauerberg, eight green bottles on mm. Zenevelde Strasse or Zenevelde Platz. That's, that would be my sort of go-to. And Otto as well, Otto restaurant there, selling wine to take away and also some really beautiful sort of homemade food goods and high quality produce. Um, von Einfach in Das Gute as well on Invalidenstrasse in Mitte. They've got a great selection of wine, great mm-hmm. selection of meat and cheese and some other goods and they're supporting other local businesses. So I highly recommend them. Uh, Barra, obviously, mm-hmm. I don't know, they probably don't need a shout out, but I love what they're doing and they definitely um, need continued support like we all do. Uh, who else is very good at the moment? Motel Beer are doing home de- home deliveries and stuff. Like I think uh, anybody who wants, ex- uh, Vinnie Couture in Charlottenburg, obviously they're delivering and they're doing free delivery for consumers and at better prices. So now is the time. If you've got spare cash and you've got a job that's paying you, Now's the time to really invest in wine because you can get wines cheaper than you ever would. So use that time to uh, use this time to be opportunistic and and support these businesses, but also earn a bit of extra cash for yourself or save some cash for yourself. Yeah, that's great advice. So Emily, as part of these interviews, you've seen a few of them. Uh, 20 questions. Exactly. I'm ready. You're ready? Yeah. Yeah, Okay. What country were you born in? The UK, so Great Britain, England, all three. <laughs> <laughs> and how many countries have you lived in? Well, that's a good question. Four, I think, four. Great. And where do your parents live? Australia. Who's the Prime Minister of London? 
the Prime Minister of England. From Boris Johnson, unfortunately. Did you vote for Brexit? No, of course not. <laughs> How Don't many countries are Brexit questions? <laughs> <laughs> That's it. You're done. Done with UK history. Um, how many countries are in the Commonwealth? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer because I don't believe in the Commonwealth. But that's because I don't believe in colonialism. I love Canada and I love all of that, but I think okay. we are independent states. So I have not um, nourished myself with enough information on that topic. Sorry. What's the most impressionable place you've ever worked? Attica in Melbourne, hundred percent. Nice. And what made you want to get into wine? It was a slow progression. I think just an appetite for wanting to know more, working in great places and being inspired by great wine lists and people. It was, I, so the people I worked with actually is maybe the short answer to the question. I was really lucky that I worked with people that fed me great wine, fed me interest in that. And then it just, um, a hobby took hold out of that. And that's where the passion grew from. Cool. People, people like every people. People's almost <laughs> the answer to every question of that sort of thing. We all, all inspire each other. Uh, do you think you're a super taster? No. Do you want to explain what a super taster is? I can. <laughs> so a super taster is someone that's got more taste buds, <laughs> more taste buds on their tongue. So they're um, highly sensitive to things like bitterness and uh, particular flavors. And I, I love bitterness. I, I believe that I've got Italian blood in me because I think I should be living in Italy because I... I love all of the vermouths and bitter drinks and, and greens and everything that you find in Italy. So I definitely don't have any sensitivity to that and I kind of crave it. But yeah, so somebody who's kind of highly tuned to those things. And I think it's just worth saying for anybody that's tuning in that's not sure, like it's got nothing to do with having a better skill set by being a super taster. And in some cases, I think it's almost worse because it means that actually some foods are intolerable for you. Well, um, are you single? Yeah, all right, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have a wine crush? Do not put this on plenty of fish because I'm not interested. <laughs> do you have a wine crush? Oh, do I have a wine crush? I think I probably have a few, but I don't know if I want to reveal them on here. Definitely not with sommeliers, actually. I'm, I actually find a lot of sommeliers unattractive, which is ironic, right? But All right, let me change the question, Emily. Yeah, change the question. <laughs> I'm trying to be really diplomatic. I don't think I should answer that. <laughs> Do you want to hook up with a winemaker? What the hell is going on? What kind of interview is this? This is not on. No, actually, do you know what? I've never, I've never actually seen my future with a wine person. I, it's not ruled out, but actually I, I quite like people that do things that are different to me. Um, and I think I'm quite stubborn and set in my ways that when I have my vineyard, I want to make my wine. I don't know if I necessarily want someone sort of wading in with their professional expertise telling me how to do it. Maybe that's, <laughs> that's the control you know, freak in you. Be, I need, you know, I'm like a wildfire. I need that space to be able to just like burn the paddock down by myself. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are other ways to describe that. Um, what's your favorite wine region? You went over a couple of them, but what's your favorite? Oh, oh okay. Uh, two favorites. Okay, so Etna, Sicily. Oh. If I could live mm. anywhere in the world, Sicily, it's so, it's stunning. You've got the coast, you've got the mountain, you've got volcanic soil, amazing grape varietals and um, so much potential. So 100% there. And then my second favourite would actually be Margaret River in Western Australia. I think it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been in the world. It's, it's a bit hippie and um, the beaches are extraordinary and there's not too many people around to get in your way. Next question. Who's your favorite wine traveling companion? Arlene Stein, of course, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, totally is. Yeah. And is she a good taster? She's a good taster, yeah. She's very good company. And, um, and she can tolerate me for days on end, which is important because I don't think I'm always the most easy person, but she makes me feel like it's that I am very relaxed and easy. And I think we always laugh a lot when we travel together. So I think... Yeah, I mean, you and Andy Ben would be number two, actually. I think, nice. uh, I mean, we travelled together as well. It's a good combination, but yeah. You're Do you know what I love about right, Emily? And when you're tasting, that you'll taste something, this is actually lemonade, but you'll be like tasting, smelling your wine, you'll be like, doesn't that smell like the lint out of a bottle of a raspberry box from the fourth <laughs> grade? And I'll be like, no, no, it doesn't.
That's not what you're supposed to say, Arlene. You're supposed to say it does. What's the worst thing about being locked in? <laughs> the worst thing about being locked in is that you can't tell anybody that you're locked in. Uh -huh. do, do you want to tell everyone what it means to be locked in? Do you know what it means to be locked in, Emily? I do, because someone explained it to me once on a wine trip. And um, yeah, I mean, th this is the thing, actually. Being on lockdown is much better than being locked in. And we can all hope that we're not locked in, because being locked in is awful. Can you pronounce that for me? Oh, no, and it's backwards. Oh, oh Nagero. <laughs> Oh my god, it literally was the wrong way around. You are such a provocative woman. So that's oregano. And for the North Americans that are watching, oregano. And possibly the Italians, but the jury's still out on that. I like to cook with sumac quite a lot. I knew that. Did you think I was going to say sumac? I did. God, I'm too predictable. <laughs> I've got to sort things out. I can't be this predictable. All right, what's your biggest pet peeve? Mm. Oh, there's a few. Mispronunciation of words. <laughs> you knew that too, didn't you? Oh, I dear. Did. All right, Emily, last question. Okay. What is the biggest lesson the restaurant industry can learn from this lockdown? That you're part of a community. And I think that's the global lesson for all of us. Um, and the important lesson at this time is that um, com the power of community it is powerful um, and um, we should support each other and and just remember like um, that we're dealing with humans like it's a human experience that we're doing I think so often we get so caught up in concept and ideas and the idea of owning a restaurant and actually you know I, I heard this somewhere I don't know if it's actually true but apparently the word restaurant comes from the word restoration to restore nice. yourself and um, yeah. and I, I've been thinking about that a lot over the last few weeks. And I think um, hopefully post this, like, I don't believe that the world's going to change radically. I know there are other people that feel differently, but I do think uh, maybe we'll all be a little bit more appreciative and, and a little bit more considerate to the people that walk through our doors and, mm -hmm. um, and that we'll take better care of people and remember that it is so much about their experience. There are so many places I've been to over the last few years where it's like you're going there to worship the, the people that work there. And actually it's, it shouldn't be about that. It should be about the people walking through the door, making them feel like they have a great time as if they were in your own home.